Hello, everyone. Uh, as I said before, handling failures in asynchronous communication while using Kafka. Uh, I was introduced, so uh, generally I'm a .NET developer at KMD. I'm working with asynchronous systems for about six years. Uh, right now we are using it uh, heavily uh, in KMD and we are based on Kafka. So I thought this might be an interesting topic uh, to cover. Um, what we are about, uh, what we are going to talk about today, uh, I'll try to bring you key concepts of Kafka that might be relevant for this uh, presentation. So we are all on the same page uh, regarding the things that we'll be talking about. So uh, late, later we will talk about what can go wrong. I prepared some failure scenarios and possible solutions that you could use uh, in your project. Uh, that's. Of course, not the exhaustive list, but just a selection of uh, possibilities that you can have. Uh, but my goal for this presentation is to just make you aware of the places that you can have some failures, uh, the possible solutions for that. So you could uh, just think for yourself whether you are prepared for the uh, exceptions that could happen before going to production. Uh, later, I have some something that I call additional consideration. Uh, I got a couple of uh, things that happen uh, during our development and uh, the things that uh, we uh, did to solve them. Uh, so you can consider whether you have this problem uh, or not. And for the end, uh, the summary. So starting with the key concept of Kafka, um, it's a distributed event streaming platform and it's a thing that is highly available, scalable, scalable and persistent and designed to have uh, to handle large uh, volume of data and it's all matters uh, because based on the configuration that you use for your Kafka brokers, for your Kafka cluster, uh, the consumers and um, uh, producers that we'll talk about in a moment, um, you have to adjust your handling, uh, failure handling strategies. Uh, so it's by design have these characteristics, but you could leverage between them uh, by using uh, a configuration. So to start, uh, if we are talking about the messaging, uh, in Kafka we have uh, something called producer, something called consumer. Uh, they're both trying to uh, communicate uh, indirectly, so they do not know about each other. Uh, the flow of messages is from the producers to consumers and they communicate uh, using Kafka. So starting from the big picture, uh, when we're talking about Kafka, we have a Kafka cluster, which is uh, a set of uh, the servers that, that, that are working together uh, to provide you the messaging um, system. In this cluster, you can have multiple brokers. Uh, broker is simply a Kafka server. Uh, that persists uh, the uh, partitions on which you save the messages. So within those brokers, you have these topics and think of a topic as a category of messages, right? So you can have uh, like um, events or some comments uh, and you could separate them into different, different topics and uh, there are the partitions, uh, so the topic consists of a partition, partitions, at least one, and those partitions give you the resilience to the failures and the possibility to scale your uh, messaging system. In those partitions, you have something like a commit log, so, so an ordered log of the messages, uh, which later the consumers can read. So the producers, the producers write to the partitions, and later, consumers who subscribe to the particular topic can read those messages. What is important uh, is that uh, both producers and consumers are connecting to Kafka cluster. So it's not a push notification to a consumer, it's rather pull from the consumer. Uh, it's quite important in terms of uh, handling the failures. Uh, I will describe these uh, elements uh, in depth a little bit uh, in, a, in a moment. So uh, that's just the overall uh, picture of the uh, Kafka architecture. And uh, now we are going to talk what can go wrong. So I found this uh, really nice quote in the Confluent uh, 
page. Uh, Confluent is one of the uh, Kafka uh, platforms. Uh, so this really shouldn't happen, but stuff happens. And uh, yeah, stuff happens and we should all be prepared for it. And as I said at the beginning, the best is to <laughs> prepare for it beforehand going to production. Uh, so right now we will try to discover some of the um, possible failures and the possible solutions to that failures. And uh, first, uh, we are going to start with the Kafka cluster failure. So it means that uh, your consumers and your producers cannot reach your message broker. And what can we do with it? So from the beginning, uh, when it matters, because it's not always the case that uh, it's uh, such a big uh, problem. So first of, first of all, uh, if your application is an entry point uh, to your system, imagine that you uh, receive some data from outer systems and your Kafka cluster is dead and uh, you cannot notify the rest of your system about incoming data. Uh, so uh, that's the first problem you might uh, occur. If uh, you are doing some in-system uh, communication, then as the persistent nature of uh, Kafka, uh, the persistent nature of Kafka lets you resume the communication later and not lose any data. But if the data is not yet in Kafka, you might lose it. Uh, the second thing is high SLA required. So if you have some contracts where you have to provide very high SLA, uh, then you might uh, not be able to just uh, return an error or some timeout uh, because of the inability to connect to your Kafka cluster. And business logic, which could be executed before producing a message, which might lead to inconsistency in your system. So imagine you get some message, you notify maybe some other uh, parties about some change, and then you cannot notify your system about uh, whatever happened. And then maybe some aggregations in your system getting wrong, and so on. So. It's, it will always depend on the business case and use cases you have and the constraints you have. Uh, how do you handle those uh, problems? So handling strategies, <laughs> you could always ignore the message. Uh, yeah, that's a simple one, but why don't we start with the simplest solutions at the beginning? Of course, uh, most likely this is not the thing that you could use, uh, but still uh, it's nice to discuss the topic and make sure that all of the messages that come into your system are very important and you cannot um, lose any of them. And I also wrote uh, the retry uh, because uh, in our example, when we are using uh, the pooling mechanism to get data into the system, uh, we can afford just to Retry. We have some external queue that we uh, pull the messages, and uh, if we pull the message, do some repack and try to send a Kafka message to the cluster, and the cluster is dead, uh, then we could simply not acknowledge the message on the queue um, and try again later. So that's a possible solution. Uh, yeah, so if we cannot afford uh, losing the data, we can try to um, send all the messages through some alternative storage. Uh, I will uh, show you an example uh, in a moment. Uh, we can even more complicate things if this is uh, something that is required. Uh, so we can start sending to alternative storage when failure starts to occur. Um, because yeah, it's a little bit of overhead, of course, and the throughput of your uh, producer will be lower uh, when you start sending to alternative storage. And uh, something interesting, also you can duplicate Kafka cluster. So if your setup is big enough and the data that you have is uh, very important, you could try to send messages to different Kafka clusters and make your consumer consume from different Kafka clusters. Also, you need to make sure that uh, those messages have uh, some kind of uh, identity so you could distinguish whether you already read the message or not. But it's, in general, uh, a good idea to do that. Uh, so, as this alternative storage, uh, there is a nice pattern that you could use, uh, transactional outbox uh, or a simple outbox if you are not committing any business logic uh, to the database. So, in normal scenario, the above one, 
uh, when you receive a message, uh, you will try to do some maybe business logic or not and try to send it to Kafka cluster. Then it might fail. And if you got enough uh, messages coming through, you might start losing your data. And if the outage is long enough, you will definitely lose your data. So the remedy for that is, uh, might be the transactional outbox. Uh, it's uh, that you decouple the producer and the Kafka cluster and you first send the data that you received to a database, uh, some kind of database, some kind of alternative storage, which is uh, with, uh, shipped with your application. And if you have to do some business logic, maybe update some order or create some customer and so on in your uh, database, you can do it in a transaction and you do both things. You do the update of your business logic and send a message to an outbox table, which can be later uh, consumed by some recurring job, uh, which is a separate thread, uh, not connected with uh, the original flow of the producer. Uh, so if this fails, this communication between recurring to the job and Kafka, uh, you can simply wait after it, uh, the Kafka cluster is recovered and start sending those messages again. It ensures you at least once delivery and if the data is, uh, if losing of the data is not acceptable, um, that's something that can help you. There is also a nice uh, pattern like secret, circuit breaker, which is also heavily used in the uh, distributed systems to cut the failing dependencies. So we can also add it on top of uh, what we just said. And it works like this. If you have the circuit closed, so everything works fine, Kafka cluster answers without any problem, it all goes without uh, any interruption, then you just communicate with Kafka cluster. But if you have some failures, um, it could be a couple of failures, a couple of retrials that fails, and you um, exceed the threshold of the failures, you open the circuit, it's like in the electricity. Uh, you open the circuit and the messages stop flowing through this uh, flow uh, and you do not communicate to the Kafka cluster directly. You can redirect maybe those messages to this transactional outbox. Uh, also, after you open the circuit, uh, after some delay, you can move this circuit breaker into the half open state, uh, which is uh, something like uh, probing uh, if we can recover maybe the connection to Kafka cluster. And if we still have a failure, we just go back to the open. But if it succeeds, we can close the, uh, the circuit and get back to normal processing. Of course, it's worth mentioning that uh, using such mechanisms that I just described might change the order of the messages. And you need to be sure that you can do that. Sometimes you could, sometimes it's very important that the message must be uh, the same as the messages comes into your system. Uh, so now let's talk about uh, the broker failure. So as I said, um, there is uh, a little bit of uh, availability uh, concepts included into the design of the Kafka. And uh, I'd like to show you a simple example, which is, by the way, a recommended setup uh, for, for the production. So it should be at least three Kafka brokers. And uh, the brokers, uh, we, can, we can set up the replication factor for our partitions. Uh, so if we have, uh, like you see, two topics, uh, topic X and topic Y, and you see that they are distributed between three brokers and those partitions are replicated. So if we send a message to uh, partition one uh, of the topic X, as you can see here, you, can you send it to the leader. Uh, the leader is chosen by the, 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 the Kafka cluster. And when this message is saved to this uh, partition, then it's replicated to the other ones on the uh, rest of the brokers. So if you have a situation that one of the brokers got down or becomes available for whatever, whatever reason, you still have all of the data in the 
rest of the brokers. So you can continue uh, producing and consuming messages without any interruptions. And if this one broker becomes unavailable, Kafka has a mechanism to uh, elect new leaders from the brokers that are still available. So uh, that's building uh, capabilities of uh, failure recovery in Kafka. So uh, this is not something that you should implement. This is something that you should configure and make sure that uh, the configuration is uh, proper. Because if you use a single broker and you have all partitions on one broker, if it goes down, you just lose the whole cluster, right? Because you have only one server. Uh, so yeah, as I said, recommend the replication factor is free. So at least you need three brokers uh, for Kafka to work properly. And as I said, uh, this is just a configuration matter. So you can uh, change uh, something in your configuration and start, uh, for example, losing data. If there is something like leader election, you can use an unclean leader election, which might lead to losing data because uh, you might select a leader that is not in sync with other uh, partitions. Uh, there is also some configuration, for example, that's just examples, that's not exhaustive list of uh, acknowledgements. So you can uh, configure your producer uh, to receive acknowledgements from different brokers and you can set how many brokers need to answer you before you consider the message to be sent. So we can say one, so you are sure that you have uh, your message on one topic, you can say two, three, or all, or even zero. That's also interesting. Uh, you can turn Kafka into um, fire and forget messaging system. So it's also interesting and uh, it uh, affects the throughput uh, of the messaging because getting all of the acknowledgements slows down uh, the production. So uh, a producer, it can also fail, uh, but uh, in this moment we won't really go uh, deep into that because uh, we just cover uh, the cluster and availability and that might be one of the things that uh, happens when the producer fails. Uh, but uh, there might be also some, some transient errors when you uh, communicate with other dependencies and so on. Uh, but this is something that all happens before even start communicating with Kafka, so we can leave it like uh, this. Oh, sorry, I lost focus of the presentations. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's switch uh, to the consumer side. Uh, it's uh, a little bit more uh, interesting in, in the topic of uh, errors. So, transient errors. Uh, so, the errors that we could uh, retry and uh, expect that they might uh, go away. So, something like unavailable dependency. So, if you're communicating some external API or I don't know, so some Redis cache or something like this, uh, you can occur simple network errors that could uh, cause uh, you uh, necessity to retry the operations. So, yeah, possible solution for that could be to simply retry operation. And we do that a lot in our setup. Uh, because we don't want a simple network glitch or something like that uh, fail the whole operation that we are currently doing. Uh, there is uh, a problem with that approach because it blocks the processing. Uh, there is no point in making consecutive retries each after another uh, because most likely during a couple of milliseconds the problem will get away, so you need to add some uh, delay between the calls and the consumer is not consuming, but waiting. Um, but there is also a second solution, like you could use uh, retry topics, which I will show you in a moment. And you could also forward uh, this message to a dead letter queue if this uh, waiting is uh, too much. And dead letter queue is just uh, another topic to which uh, you use to send the messages that couldn't be processed. And later you can decide what to do with them, maybe resend some of them, or maybe do some manual handling of them, or maybe reorder the data if you have such possibility. Uh, in .NET we have a nice, uh, nice solution for the retry operations, uh, like a poly um, package. Uh, it also contains the uh, capabilities of uh, setting a circuit breaker that I uh, just uh, were talking a uh, couple minutes ago. Uh, 
So right now, uh, I'd like to show you the idea of retry topics. So this is a non-blocking solution for retrial of the messages. So if you cannot uh, wait, because you have such a, a lot of messages on your topic and uh, you cannot just stop the consuming and uh, hope for the mm, transient error to go away because not all the messages are affected by it. You can, uh, yeah, the consumer produces uh, an outcome, might consume, but if it fails, you can redirect uh, your message to a retry topic. And this is the first retry topic to just show you the idea. And you prepare uh, another consumer, which is consuming just from this retry topic, with some delay. So let's say a minute or two or something like that. Then, if it all, if the problem went away, you just produce the message to the outcome uh, topic or whatever it is, uh, what your uh, consumer is doing, and everything is fine. But it could also fail, and you see the pattern. You can use couple of retry topics and couple of retry consumers. But if you uh, decide that this is too much, we cannot retry forever. And generally, as a rule of thumb, it's not a good idea to uh, retry forever anything. You can send it to the dead letter topic. And later, you could have different ideas of how to handle it. Uh, for example, you could have some dead letter consumer which sends it to some monitoring or some application that could manually handle your, your problems. Uh, so that's an example of non-blocking retrials. Uh, speaking of non-transit errors, aka poison pill, or what I heard, uh, like stop the world message, uh, I guess this is the best uh, name for it, uh, you might occur an error which is uh, non-retriable. Uh, and your application keeps trying to process the message and gets the same exception and the same thing happens again. So, for example, you have some deserialization error, some error in your application logic. You just won't go away until you fix the code uh, or change the schema or whatever. Uh, you'll just uh, keep retrying and maybe even uh, producing a massive amount of logs uh, to your uh, log provider and it also costs money. So that's not a situation that we would like to have in our setup. So there are a couple of possible solutions to do that. Uh, if you cannot afford to not process uh, the message that came, uh, you might stop processing, fix the code, and then resume from the place you started, uh, you stopped. Uh, you can send message to a dead letter queue, and that's something that we use. So we trying to uh, process the message a couple of times, and if we cannot process it for, uh, for such reasons, for different reasons, we just send it to the dead letter queue. Uh, we can skip the message. And Kafka gives us the possibility to manually change the offset uh, of the consumer. So if the sixth message is uh, broken here, we can just say, OK, let's go to the seventh, or even let's start with the earliest message that uh, came, to the, uh, came to the topic. But uh, the skipping one message uh, might be uh, not a good idea because you have, have, if you have an error in application logic, it won't solve your problems. Uh, we can also wait until the message expires uh, because if you have uh, so, um, not a big retention on our topic because Kafka, as I said before, is persistent. It persists the messages for some time. If you have uh, this time uh, configured as uh, not a big amount of time, then uh, you can just simply wait. That's an also possible uh, solution for that. Also, it's worth to mention that we can prevent such things. And uh, what we do is uh, to make sure that our producers and consumers use the same uh, specification, the same schema of the messages. So we use an API first approach when we first define uh, the contracts that we use for both the consumers and producers. And later, we uh, generate the code of the models, of the controllers, uh, of, the, yeah, of the models of the messages uh, that are both used with the same producers and consumers. It's not error-free uh, because you still can break something. You have to maintain backward comp compatibility of the schemas. Uh, but it's a good start uh, to um, keep it in sync. Uh, 
Uh, also, uh, it's a good idea to test uh, the system for poison pill messages. So, uh, it might be nice if you just uh, throw some uh, poison pill messages or what you consider to, to might be into your system and see how it behaves. A uh, couple of uh, additional considerations so, uh, of things that, uh, at which we failed, uh, which I found interesting and I'd like to share. Uh, so, first thing is uh, to watch out for the configuration. This is uh, something that we did and we created a little uh, dead letter Q message generator. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty funny. Uh, we had uh, we have a configuration of topics, uh, something like that. You, you see the pattern that we got the tell, and we got some name of the topic, and uh, we used uh, consumer configuration to start consuming from those uh, topics like this. A uh, consumer could be fed with the regex pattern uh, to make it consume from more than uh, one message and. Uh, Nice feature of that is that if the Kafka consumer detects new topics that matches this pattern, they will automatically start reading from them. So we also have dead letter queues topics. And uh, we have a setup uh, that um, creates the topic if you produce it and it doesn't exist. Uh, so maybe you'll see uh, where this is going right now. Uh, we, 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 we forget the dollar here. Uh, which, which effectively made something like this, that, uh, watch out for the regexes, right? Which, uh, when we received some message that failed a couple of times, and then we redirected it to the dead letter Q topic, which didn't exist yet, it was created, and then our consumers see, hey, this is our new topic, I start consuming it. And he starts to consume it from the dead letter Q topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we consumed this badly uh, message. I, I cannot remember what was the problem with it, but it couldn't be consumed. And we, what we could do, generated another message for that letter Q topic. And uh, then we consume it again and again and again. And a couple of thousand messages later, <laughs> uh, we found it. Uh, we, we, we found that dollar <laughs> was missing. Uh, another thing that's uh, worth mentioning uh, that uh, <laughs> was uh, quite surprising for us is that on these topics, on production, at least in our company, uh, developers don't have easy access to the production data. And to be honest, if there are some sensitive data, they shouldn't have, right? Uh, and we got some also audit requirements if a developer needs to access them. This should be at least safe that someone access the data, so the customer knows that, okay, someone has access to my data. And uh, we went to production with uh, Kafka utility that didn't have authorization, <laughs> didn't have audit requirements, and we simply didn't have access to our topics. Uh, we also might ask our platform team to just, uh, hey, could you drop me some messages? And But it was tedious and um, was uh, quite a long journey to, to get the messages and if you got some problem on production that some of the messages go to the DLQ, you'd rather like to uh, see them immediately and act on, on the problems, right? So <laughs> lately we found something like UR for Apache Kafka, uh, it's uh, Kafka UI. Uh, which have some nice capabilities uh, that just from screenshots from their uh, documentation. Uh, so I think that's worth mentioning that there is a tool that have role-based access control. They even have data masking. So if you have something that even if you access the topic and try to read something from it, shouldn't be visible to the developers, uh, you can obfuscate the data. It has a couple of nice settings when you can completely hide the data or just uh, let the developers know how, what is the length of the data that is there, what is the data type and so on. So there is some, some, some kind of possibility to configure it. And it has some audit log, which we didn't yet make to work, uh, but we are working on it. And we really wait for that to be on our production. And uh, there is also an interesting topic of a number of connections uh, to a cluster. Uh, one day, uh, our platform, uh, our architect, came to us and said, 
hey guys, you got a vast amount of connections to the Kafka. Uh, oh, how it's possible, right? And uh, it turned out that each consumer producer keeps open connections to all necessary brokers. So if you have your partitions of five different brokers, like we have, if you have a single consumer, you could connect to all of them. So you get five connections to a broker uh, for one topic. And we got like a couple of consumers, a couple of producers in, in our setup. And we generated like 600 connections from one application. That was a big one. And uh, as a role of AMP, it's, if possible, you should start uh, with a single producer, a single consumer uh, for your application to, to avoid the situation. So we uh, use uh, the byte array serializer, so something for default, and we take care of the serialization of the messages by ourselves. But this is something to remember uh, to not DDoS your Kafka cluster. <laughs> Uh, and I also like to encourage you to try it yourself. Uh, during the research for this uh, presentation, I found some uh, quick start pages from Confluent or Panda. They give you very easy access to set up a Kafka cluster on your own computer uh, by just launching a Docker Compose file. You just put one comment into your uh, terminal, a couple of minutes of downloading, and you got working Kafka cluster on your computer. Also, uh, they have a couple of tutorials, that's the Confluent uh, I.O. page, which uh, has uh, ready to start uh, producer and consumer code, so you can start playing with the Kafka configuration and trying to, you know, uh, maybe disable it, that's what I did, <laughs> uh, to, to, to experience how it will behave. And you can do it all in a couple of minutes uh, on your computer, so I think it's, uh, it's really great. On the Read Panda page, you have also the configuration for single brokers and free brokers, so you can simulate also what could happen if the brokers go, broker go down. And, yeah. The summary. So, uh, my goal for this uh, presentation was to just uh, touch some points where uh, the, the Kafka communication can be broken and maybe let you think for, uh, for a bit uh, whether in your systems uh, you might uh, find something to improve. Uh, I showed you some uh, patterns like circuit breaker, like a transactional load box, uh, how to use the letter queues, or maybe retry topics. Uh, this is all uh, like a toolbox that you could use to handle um, the wrong messages, the failures in your setup. And a couple of tips for the end. Uh, Carefully plan your error handling strategy. It's good to know your constraints, whether you uh, need to keep the order of the messages, whether you need to, might ignore some of them. So it all affects your uh, Kafka failure uh, stra uh, handling strategy. And of course, uh, you also need to look at your configuration because it also affects how it behaves. Uh, prepare test cases for failures, and of course, uh, so that was uh, related, for example, to this poison pill messages. Uh, be sure that your configuration is right, that relates, for example, to the topic configuration on, and whatever uh, else. Uh, don't go simply the default configuration, because uh, you might uh, be surprised after going to production. And uh, remember about uh, proper monitoring. It's uh, very important, for example, if you have a uh, dead letter queue message generator, it's nice to know about this <laughs> until you pay uh, a lot of money for logs and see that your uh, consumer is not working. So that will be all. Thank you. <laughs>